Hola. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos y bienvenidos. Welcome everyone. Hello. Good morning. This is the third version of the International Seminar uh, Practices, uh, Contemporary Practices and Imagination, Political Imagination. That is radical. I am Monica Muñoz and I am very glad to be here with Fernanda Can Carvajal. She's a researcher and a professor, Fred uh, Martin and Stefano Harney. So today we will be talking about the uh, new uh, core of discussions that is focused on the new ways of thinking and organizing what is common from the artistic practices, enabling new ways of living. So to take advantage of time, I will just give you a brief uh, introduction. Fred and Stephanie are uh, authors are all incomplete, published in this year, in 2001, and The Under Commons, uh, this was published in 2013. And it was um, published as the uh, Estudio Negro in 2017. They have written uh, chapters of books and articles of magazines. Fred uh, teaches in the performance department of the University of New York and Stefana in the Academia of New Means of Colonia. They study uh, the tradition of the black. And I want to remind you that the seminar is being transmitted through the YouTube channel of the Centro Nacional Contemporáneo and Facebook, Facebook Live. And in the channel of the center, there are two links where you will have the possibility of listening to us just in English or just in Spanish. So you can choose whatever is better for you. I also wanted to tell you that after this conversation, we'll open the floor for questions from the public. And I would like to, I would like for you to consider this as a space for reflection that can be open in this sense, uh, we will invite you to leave your reflections and your questions in the chat, knowing that probably not all of them are going to be answered today. They are going to be available as to retake this conversation at some other point. So without further ado, Fernanda, Fred, Stefano, thank you very much for being here uh, with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I would like to thank you, first of all, for inviting me uh, to this seminar, along with Angelica, Fred, and Stefano. I wanted to thank everybody who is listening to us in their houses and everybody who has made all of this possible, uh, people behind the scenes, too. Uh, thank you, Isabela Neira, Soledad Novoa, Corina Bravo. And I wanted to briefly tell you about how we thought about this conversation. That it has as the starting point, the Under Commons book that was translated into, the, into Spanish as the Los Comunes Desde Abajo, which is a book that is, it was talked about, as Angelica said, from the uh, radical tradition of the black and the black studies and this uh, post-colonial um, studies. And this is also related to the thinkers, the Italian thinkings, thinkers. The, it, the uh, versions are uh, on the internet. The two versions in English and Spanish are available on the internet if you want to uh, read it. So the work of Fred and Stefano allow us to rethink about the common aspects from the uh, from their writing styles and the interlinked writing style that they practice and this perspective of the what is uh, the common underground things is what we are going to be talking about so i want to talk about the epistemological uh, changes and contextual uh, differences that could be between the writing styles of stefano and the uh, also Frederick and the things that have going have been going on in Chile in the last year. So we think that there is a, a common vibration in what they capture in their writing and also the process that started in Chile. 
with the social unrest of 2018. So in 2018. So we hope that this is a, a moment to start asking questions, things that do not have to just be answered now and closed. What we want to do, as Angelica said, was to have the space for conversation, to be able to uh, talk together, to be able to start studying together. Okay, so we have a small roadmap for all of this, and we're going to see how everything starts changing as we go along. But I wanted to start with um, an image of the manifestations, the image that started all of this in 2019 that was started by the high school um, students that started calling out to not pay for the metro fare. So that evasion call was accompanied by an incitation to other ways to use our bodies. So skipping a, a barrier instead of paying for a fare. And that had an effect that was uh, unexpected. Many people started uh, saying evading, not paying, another way of fighting, which was the most emblematic uh, part of, of all of this, the beginning of this. So you owe us uh, a life or until life is worth it, or you took so many things away from us that you took fear away from us. So these, all of these phrases are at the heart of the social manifestations. And these are all things that show the neoliberal system that we have in Chile. Education, health, the consumption of goods and also retirement. So, I wanted to show you this image of this bodies changing their uh, shapes to skip a barrier. Uh, this also, this the lack of obedience. We wanted to start with this uh, slogans that talk about a huge debt and the uh, evasion, the massive evasion as the force that started all of this. So the first question would be related to how you think about your uh, your underground commons and the debt. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Fernanda and uh, Lika, for for being in conversation with us. And and I think we'd like to start just by welcoming and thanking everyone who's uh, joined us today. Um, uh, I, I promise we will come specifically to your question on debt, but just before we do, I, I, I wanted also to, to tell you how grateful uh, we've been for your correspondence in this last few weeks as we've built up to this, <clears throat> and especially grateful for the moments when you've said that you or your comrades, your students, have felt uh, connected to the work uh, we're doing in the Undercommons and in our <clears throat> partnership. Um, and, and to say to you that if, if it feels connected to you, it, it's probably because as Fred was saying before we came on air, uh, we've always been connected to you in Chile um, in many, many ways, but not least because uh, Fred and I uh, came of age, as, as they say, uh, when, when we went to college, it was the, it, it was the, in the eighties, the beginning of our own experience in the United States of neoliberalism. But of course we were already aware that the experiment being carried out on us had already been carried out somewhere else and largely by us somewhere else. Um, my father's best friend when I was growing up <clears throat> was a man named Michael Harrington, who became a US congressman. And in the early 70s, shortly after the uh, coup, 
Michael Harrington uh, illegally uh, leaked all the documents from Congress in the United States, proving uh, the involvement of the US government, of, of, of Kissinger, uh, of Nixon, of, of everyone who was uh, uh, Ford, et cetera, everyone who was involved in the, uh, uh, the, the execution of that, of that coup. Uh, so we grew up with that. Uh, uh, in fact, my, my uncle just made a trip to Chile two years ago to see some of these <clears throat> sites memorialized now. Um, and, and, and when we were at college together, you know, the dictatorship was very much on our mind. So if, if some of the things now that have entered our writings echo uh, with, with what's happening in Chile, I think that's because for a very long time we've been, we've been with you, uh, however we could be. Um, and uh, so in a way, it almost feels like this is a, a reunion uh, rather than um, a first meeting. Um, and, um, and that's certainly how, that's certainly the emotion that I have, uh, as I talk to you, um, as we talk to you today. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll pause and, and just let, uh, Fred speak. Again, yeah, just to echo Stefano's thanks to you, uh, Fernanda and Nico, we, we were, very honored and, and 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 happy to, as Stefano says, to be reunited. Um, there maybe it's maybe there's a more general sense in which no, no meeting is ever really the first meeting, um, but that what you know what study makes possible is the you know the the increasing realization of the depth of the of the relationship. Um, and the, the increasing realization of the, the, the long history of, 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 of an encounter that, that on the one hand, you know, history has, has imposed upon us, you know, insofar as we are all embedded in a long 500 year history of a war of conquest. Um, and as our friend Manolo Callahan puts it by way of Ivan Illich, a, a war against subsistence. Um, these are the conditions uh, of our meeting, and yet there are other conditions that predate that condition. Um, and the reunion is is one that that, that that can be traced back to those, you know, more fundamental, um, you know, conditions, which are um, at one point in the correspondence you referred to a, an ontological condition, and maybe this is even a, a pre-ontological condition um, that, and, and in a way that pre-ontological condition is I guess what we, what it is that we are trying to approach, you know, with the term under commons and also what we're trying to approach with the term debt. Um, and, and uh, you know, another word that we could use would be sharing. Um, but, but then the question has to be, you know, or, or not, we could even use the word, you know, that again, had it, that has, I know, come up very powerfully in, in the work of, of indigenous activists and thinkers there in Chile. We, the other word that we might use is, is reciprocity. And, you know, we have to think about these terms and really grapple with them, um, and grapple with the ways that maybe none of these terms are fully adequate to what it is that we, to what it is that we do. Um, and, and at the same time, none of these terms are fully adequate to, to what it is that has been done to us. But, um, but yeah, we, we, maybe, maybe we'll, maybe we can, and, and, and maybe we can keep running through this thread that kind of allows us to talk about uh, debt and, under commons and what we mean by that and also or what we want to mean by that and also the as you as y'all beautifully put it the the change of shape um and the loss of contour of individual bodies that that is manifest in in the practice of jumping the turnstile um so uh well maybe we can we can go there um 
I'll kick it back to you, Stefano, and then we can. Um, I just don't want to go on too long at, at any any one time. So. Yeah, um, I I also uh, 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 want to make sure, Fernando, that you feel like we're addressing uh, so much of what you set up, I, and just a piece of it seems to me to be. Um, that one of the things we've been able to, from a distance, to observe, uh, and and we're we're observing it today, for instance, in in Sudan, uh, with regard to the resistance committees that are set up there as part of um, the attempt to to rid themselves of the the rule they're under, is is this this battle over gathering this battle over assembly. Um, and um, when Manolo Callahan talks about renewing our habits of assembly, I think one of the things, and that's a phrase that we've picked up and it's been so resonant for us and, and, and we felt it strongly through the struggles, uh, observing the struggles of the last two years in Chile on the streets, especially, um, not just in the high profile protests, but uh, as you've pointed out, in all the small acts of resistance of trying to do something differently. And, and really what we're faced with is maybe one way to say it would be to say that, <clears throat> you know, we tend to think of the state in certain ways they're handed down to us from the European tradition. And they've never really worked in the new, in the so-called new world, in the colonized world. Um, it's, it's never really made any sense that, you know, the, the state was a monopoly on violence. If, you, if, you've, if you've lived a colonized life, it's never really made any sense that the state uh, secures the difference between public and private property as, as a Marxist analysis in Europe might have it. But what has always made sense is that the state maintains an utter monopoly on gathering. It, the only way you're allowed to come together is under state sanctioned conditions. Any other way to get together is immediately criminal and dangerous and subject to the most intense violent reaction. So, so it's so inspiring to see people insist on renewing their habit of assembly, on, on trying to create an autonomous form of gathering that is not either sponsored by capitalism in the, in the malls or, or sponsored by the, the, the state in the public square, um, but is something that is generated by our own needs and by a recognition that we, we have to get together. We need to get together, you know, um, just, just, as it, it says, just as it says again and again in popular music, you know, we need to get together. And that's because it hurts to be apart because as Fred said, we are shared. We are shared and we are shared out, which means we have to be together and we have to find ways to be together. Unfortunately, those ways are almost always under the reduced, impoverished, and, uh, and discouraging forms of state sponsorship, of gathering, of getting together, of being together. Um, and, and so I, I just felt so much in these last years, reading and watching things coming out of Chile, now also out of Sudan, periodically in many places where I can feel these habits um, being renewed in the face of the most uh, extraordinary uh, duress. Um, and it's like our collective memory of debt at that moment is at its strongest. The, the video that, that, that y'all sent us of the 
the young women in school who were practicing jumping the turnstiles was was really, you know, illustrative and indicative of those general conditions of, and also practices and habits of of, of assembly um, that 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 Stefano was just talking about. And, it, and of course it, it gives us a chance. I mean, you know, the, the thing about the undercommons is like it was, uh, you know, books are, are, are overrated, you know, in a lot of ways. And, and they, in many ways, books can be understood as an attempt to privatize, you know, study. Um, and, and when I say privatize, I mean, not only place study under, the, under regimes of ownership, but also um, place study under under a kind of regime of scarcity. Um, and if there's anything, the only thing that's worth the, what what the book is for, is is for is the process of exploding, so to speak, out of its own limits, out of its own binding, literally, you know. Um, and 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 that happens in a couple of different ways. One is you know, when, when it circulates, when it when it literally is published, when it can when it when that when that sort of gesture towards publicness and towards publishing becomes a real practice. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we were so happy um, to be able to to make the undercommons, you know, more generally accessible just by putting it online. It's not because we thought that everything we had to say was so important that everybody in the world needed to read it. It was just that we just wanted to, we, what, again, we, we wanted to reunite. We, we wanted to, to make a gesture of connection. And in that gesture of connection, what we also realize is that our study deepens, it, it is refined so that none of the terms and none of the so-called concepts in, in undercommons are are fixed in stone. They, they are already. They were already. They've been in the midst of a revision that, that occurs as a function of this depth of study and of this deepening of, of study. So, so even just in this few weeks of corresponding together, we're beginning to understand this relationship. I think between debt and and gathering um, a little bit more, and and also beginning to understand that the relation between debt and gathering is one that we could talk about in terms of practice. And, 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 and it, it reinitializes maybe some of the ways that we were thinking about, you know, well, the term, and you have to forgive my, 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 well, I, I, I was in, again, in the midst of trying to translate Claudio's piece yesterday, I was thinking about the, you have to forgive me, I can't even know, I don't know if I can even remember the term, but the, 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 there's, a, there's a term that, that he used to talk about the, the press, the, hop, the hapticality, the touch of, of, of uh, it's at the very, I was translating it as hapticality or touch or press or handing or fingering, uh, uh, a caress even um but but it's a general caress that is not only a practice but it then becomes the atmosphere of the of other practices right and um and and ultimately it both constitutes a condition for the myth of the plurinational and at the same time it constitutes the the condition for the busting of, and the, the breaking of that myth you know again in 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 more extended and more radical practice um and but that's what we were trying to and all we were trying to do is to try to see if we could understand something about that and 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 work on it with other with other people um and so um so so what's amazing is to see these moments of of well, we could call them reciprocity and we could call them touch and we could call them, you know, moments of, I don't want to say the word recognition, but, but I kind of want to say moments of kinship. I, I, 
you know, where, you know, you hear it in, in the music and you see it in the way people move and in the way that people move, you know, joyously. One, one last thing I'll say, um, the, the practice of jumping the turnstile seems to me to turn, it turns, it's, a, it's an international practice, you know, um, so many, um, man, the, 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 the violent New York City Police Department crackdown on youth jumping the turnstile over the last few years has been brutal and, and, and vicious. Um, what's interesting is to consider what the relationship is between that long insurgent practice that youth, and, and I would say, you know, primarily black and brown youth in New York City have been engaging in, and the explicit um, political announcement, so to speak, that, that the youth in, in, in Chile have been making by way of that same practice. It, their understanding of what they're doing gives us a better way of understanding what the kids that we see every day have been, have long been doing. Um, and, um, and so again, it's, it's so crucial and so beautiful to, to be able to, to reunite like this um, in order to understand the way in which we are involved in this common practice, which is an already existing gathering and which is an already existing manifestation of our, of our sharing together and of our, you know, indebtedness um, together. Would you like to add something to that, Fer? Yes, for everyone listening, I would like to tell you that the text that Fred was referring to is a text that was published by Claudio Alvarado in CIPER at the beginning, no, during the first months of the revolt. And he was using the term sovageo, which is sort of uh, touching one another, and it goes back to to this idea of the sovageo or the touching each other, and it relates to what happens when you are in a demonstration, when you are out in the street, and it is a very interesting notion or concept. And that was just to give you a little bit of context if you were listening and you were not aware of that piece that uh, they were referring to. So I wanted to go back a little bit to this idea of the ways of engaging with each other, the ways of engaging in a connection and the ways of sharing that you mentioned, Fred. And going back to the debt and how you understand debt and to see what are the points of encounter with reciprocity, as you've said it, and the core of the discussion yesterday in the seminar was called participation and reciprocity. And different uh, groups of artists, as well as other people, other thinkers talked about that as well. And back to your work, debt is in a structural condition for the Chilean society. And you are proposing to understand sort of a, a state of debt that cannot be paid off, it cannot be forgiven. We understand that there is this concept of a damage, historical damage that cannot be repaid. And you also talk about credit at something as something different to debt and abolishing the calculation that credit requires and to turn debt into something different. You're thinking about bad debt as a principle and as a space that generates our ability to be a society. So we were wondering what may come up when we think about debt as a way of participating in a society in relation to the principles of reciprocity, for instance, the indigenous reciprocity or the 
reciprocity that the Andes indigenous peoples practice when given goes beyond just the exchange of goods, or it tries to leave aside the calculation of benefit because it happens in the context of affective production to generate friendship at the end of the day. It is a relationship of correspondence that produces value and it allows us to acknowledge one another as people. And as Marta Gonzalez said, and I will quote her, she also describes that moment of correspondence as to look at oneself in the mirror of the soul. And I will include the quote, which is, the Aini, which is this exchange, is to give and to receive, to reproduce. If you don't reproduce the Aini, you lose the soul or you lose the mirror in which you look at yourself. And this reminds me of your idea of sharing, not as an interpersonal relationship. And I believe I'm quoting Fred in this case. And first I will say it in English. One has been accessed because we are already in each other. Lo que en español sería algo así como uno es compartido. And in English, it would be one is shared. We are accessed to because we are already in each other. And I wanted to know if this idea of looking at each other in the mirror of the soul and this idea of sharing and being as accessed is something that you see here in relation to the situation. And also, could you elaborate more on your understanding of what debt is? Um, Fred, maybe I'll start and jump in if you want. Um, well, let's take, uh, Let's take the original condition uh, of debt in our hemisphere. Uh, and, and that's Haiti. Um, as you know, there are 200,000 Haitians in Chile. To give you a sense of how big that is in the diaspora, there are only 800,000 in the United States. It's a massive uh, diaspora and we, we have no exact count of how many Haitians are in, in Brazil, but it could be almost that number as well. <laughs> now, Haiti is a, as you know, its history it is a history of uh, perpetual debt. It, it will never be allowed to quote unquote pay off uh, for its crime of revolution. Uh, for its crime of um, defeating the colonial powers. But what if in a way, <clears throat> um, oh, well, Brett? yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to. <laughs> if well, you can. There's, there's a, we often quote uh, one of the great novelists in the African American tradition um, who we think, you know, is in some ways, I, I mean, I would say at least has written, the, the, you know, the greatest novel published in the United States, at least in the 20th century, Zora Neale Hurston. She wrote a, a great um, novel called Their Eyes Were Watching God. And early on in that novel, um, the two main characters, Janie and um, Phoebe, are sitting on a porch talking. And at one point, Janie, who's the narrator of the novel of the, the story, says something to the on the order of my friend, my tongue is in my friend's mouth. Um, and and we have we have often, you know, appealed to that formulation um, as we work together and think together and try to understand even just the nature, you know, we could even say the biological nature and the physical nature of our own, um, of our own partnership, um, recognizing that partnership is not really quite the right word. Um, 
And um, so so when when Stefano cuts out like that because of technical difficulties, <laughs> then that's when we appeal to the to the formulation that uh, <laughs> you know his tongue is is in my mouth at that moment. Um, but since he's back, I'll let him finish pick up where he where he left off, and then we'll come back. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry about that. I, I'll be uh, I'll just continue along these lines. Uh, what if the reason that Haitian debt has only got worse and worse is precisely the reason, Angelica, that you were suggesting that there's a relationship between access and debt? That that the more that you live a life of access, of, of a kind of uh, openness to the to the sharedness that already exists, uh, the more debt you accumulate. Um, it, this seems to me to be as much of a reason. Well, let me put it differently. You often hear people in what has become un unintentionally, I guess, almost a, a Okay, well, let me, let me imagine that I can, uh, there's a, <laughs> there's an old, uh, there's another old um, sort of practice in, in the, in the tradition of American music, of, of African American music, jazz, um, in which two supposed soloists, um, go back and forth in a kind of rapid fire conversation that is referred to as trading fours. Um, and maybe that's what we're doing a little bit now too, is sort of trading fours. Um, each, each, each musician plays four bars and at a certain moment, what appeared at a certain point to have been the expression of an individual soloist is in fact, um, you know, is in fact a, a a, a co-production of entities which at a certain moment it seems to becomes impossible to just think of them as separable entities okay so i i'm gonna I'm kick it back to stefano again but but my sense of it is that from different directions we've always been trying to move towards this common formulation that constitutes a fundamental distrust in the way that sociality is actually described, right? That the, that the language that we have for social existence is inadequate to the practice of social existence. First of all, that social existence is a practice, but second of all, that it is not, that insofar as it is a practice, it is not an endless series or collection of individual acts. Um, and some of what I think we were trying to get at by debt comes from that realization, but you go again, man. So. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, I just think that, you know, I was saying sometimes you, you get this very routine acknowledgement of Haiti in which Haiti is acknowledged for being the first revolutionary society, the sort of successful slave revolt against the colonizers and the slavers. Uh, and then a regret as to how, how much Haiti was uh, piled with debt and, and, and invasion subsequently, <clears throat> which doesn't leave the Haitian people with much in the way of their own strategies for what they have been doing for the last several hundred years. And one of the strategies that seems evident is that they have been teaching us how to practice uh, a life that is open to access. And they've paid the terrible price that anybody pays uh, who attempts to lead a collective life of access. And in a way, maybe that's the even greater importance of Haiti to the these continents than the revolution itself is the insistence to continue to live without the closing down 
of sociality into individuation. This is another way to think of courage. So just to imagine that I'm going to go in a direction that's similar to where Stefano was going. If you, what does it mean to, what is the, what is the, what, what, what does the invocation of, of, of Haiti and its revolution uh, mean for, for political, for normative political theory? Um, there's a there's a, a great political theorist named Susan Buck Morse who has tried to write about the the sort of veiled, hidden, suppressed importance of the Haitian Revolution for Hegel, for instance. And and one way to think about the work that she was doing in that book is she was beginning to excavate what it is about Haiti that remains incommensurable to political thought. Um, to fold Haiti into the history of liberal revolution, to try to fold his, Haiti into the history of the revolutions that emerge as a function of political individuation, right, is, is a betrayal, okay, of what was actually happening in Haiti, which was that, at least in our view, not about a political revolution for individuation at all. But it's also to deny the brutal historical constraints on the very possibility of individuation that were already that were the fundamental conditions of, of Haitian social existence before the revolution, right? So, so the question is, how do we better understand, right? The 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 the, the and again, what's crucial for us about the Haitian example? What's crucial for us as we endure the long event of conquest is to try to get a much clearer understanding of what that revolution was and how it works so as to hold it off from being to protect it as it were from being folded into right the ongoing history of normative political theory right? but i i was imagining what you were going to say <laughs> I heard a lot of that, and I was okay. going to say most of that, just a okay. little less, just a little less well. Okay. Uh, I, I think another reason to think about Haiti outside of that liberal revolutionary tradition is also to think about is also to think about the the post colonial moment differently. Um, you know. Uh, Fred and I often ask sort of rhetorically, what's the, what's the longest running anti-colonial revolt, anti-colonial insurgency, anti-colonial movement, you know, in the history uh, uh, of the modern world? And our, and our answer is uh, that that anti-colonial movement persists to this day uh, in the United States. Um, and most specifically among African-Americans, indigenous people, uh, Latinx people who have been fighting a 500 year anti-colonial battle against a colonial state called the United States as it emerges. And, and, they, and there's no way that that can be considered a post-colonial condition unless and until we're willing to say where there is no post-colonial condition. Because what Chile seems to point out more than anything else from the outside is just how similar it is to, to the ongoing anti-colonial movement in the United States in the sense that there is, there's no way to think in terms of an independent post-colonial state as something that's gonna be a vehicle um, for, for, for anything like a, a way to live differently. Um, and this seems also uh, to be, you know, an aspect of our reunion. And, and it's like the, the vicious emergence of neocolonialism 
in and and that would be and that's the other thing. How how would you periodize neocolonialism, man? Like, you know, we think about it maybe like in the seventies, and and obviously, you know, the the coup in, in Chile could be seen as like. But is that is that the moment of neocolonialism's invention, or is that the moment of neocolonialism's announcement of itself? Right, it's it's brazen announcement of itself, and but and the point would be, what's the, but what if it turns out that in a certain weird way, neocolonialism predates the the, the supposed moment of advent of the postcolonial, right? That in a weird way, what neocolonialism does is it prepares the way for the illusion of the post-colonial. Mm -hmm. And and one way to think about it, and, the, and and the way that you would test this out would be to think about the various modes of the imposition of credit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not in which, and one way to think about it is, is that credit is the corruption or degradation of an already existing condition of indebtedness. Or another way to put it is, credit is the violent individuation of indebtedness. And that individuation manifests itself not only with regard to impositions that are placed on the so-called individual subject, but also impositions that are placed on the emergent, nascent, developing state. Okay. Um, and, and, and my sense of it is that this is something which is obviously being That, that this is a that this is a brutal hemispheric experiment that is being carried out as violent, vicious American imperialism begins to mature, and it probably goes back to the late 19th century. And it's certainly and there's a military component to it. Um, it it it's and and more importantly, and and at the level of how people actually live, there's a paramilitary component to it. And in some ways, the experiment could be traced really all the way back to US policy in the United States, in, internal to the United States after the Civil War. In other words, what we're talking about is this, as Stefano was saying, this long war against gathering, the long imposition of policing and militarism against gathering, against indebtedness. And it plays itself out as an individuating force, which is a carceral force. And an individuating force is not the same as a differentiating force, right? One of the pairs of this imposition of credit is that it individuates through the imposition of a regime of sameness. Okay. And that sameness manifests itself with regard to statistics, with ratings, right? With, with the development of a, of a univocal measure Right, that 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 that, that an, and an algorithmic measure that applies to every so-called individual that allows them to be so you know so that the distinction between having good credit and bad credit signifies on some level, but the basic formulation is that it always means that you are subject to a rating, subject that you have been folded into an algorithmic structure, right? That that places you within an already given hierarchical framework. What, what all of this goes back to the naturalization of individuation as as part of as 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 a fundamental element of the human plot of the human trajectory. Okay. So to fold Haiti into that story, right, is in a weird way already a kind of well, it's a liberal imposition. Okay, right. We, what one wants to resist is folding Haiti into the history of liberalism. What one wants to resist is, 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 and what I'm sure that you all are working hard to resist now in Chile is folding the current eruption, folding the current insurgency into a history of liberalism. Right. To resist that, because to resist that folding into liberalism is also to resist that enfolding into neoliberalism and into what we might call, you know, the ruses of, of post-coloniality, right? So, so, so when we talk about indebtedness, one way to think about it is, is that it is just this continual ongoing 
social and ecological struggle, okay, against coloniality, against settlement. And look, I mean, it feels like sometimes everything turned into a, a philosophy class when it shouldn't be that way. But, but some of this could have to do with, I, I spent a lot of time last night not being able to sleep because I was obsessing over the distinction between constituent, destituent, and, and I guess what you would call instituent power, you know, and sort of obsessing over a garment, which one should never probably admit to having done. But, but, but these terms are part of what the, the problem is, part of what we're trying to work through, you know. Um, it's just this fundamental interplay between credit, individuation, and the regime of neo slash liberalism, right? And um, I, I think it's a set of empirical problems, right? That anyway, I, I won't keep going. Maybe. Um maybe connected to this is that <clears throat> there's a there's another word uh, that we might say no <laughs> Stefano <laughs> it's a mystery what what was that word we'll never know um, <laughs> but that's look I mean well this is Look, you know what? All we ever are trying to do is cobble something together in the face of, you know, conditions which are not always of our making and not always in our control. Um, um, and and so I can't I can't I don't know what that word would be. Um, he'll be back in a minute, and I'm sure he'll he'll tell us. Mm -hmm. But maybe the lesson here, um, and maybe it's like an old fashioned, you know, Derridian lesson, is that there is no unique word, right? That, that, that there's this kind of, that part of the work of study is something like this continual process of proposing terms that then we also deposed. Um, um, so this, this, this interplay of proposition and deposition um, as, a mod, as a modality of, and, and what's at stake is not the justness or the unjustness of any given term, but this continual practice we engage in of proposition and deposition. Um, I, I, you could call it a, a, mo, a mode of cultivation, but I think that we maybe would want to resist that term just because of the historic and etymological connections of cultivation and coloniality, cultivation and settling. Um, the, the term that Stefano and, and, and his partner, Tanika Seeley Thompson, have begun to use and that I totally and uh, uh, in love with, I suppose, is is ground provision. <laughs> um, uh, I was I was saying that uh, that maybe the practice Stefano is not is there's this continual practice we have of proposing and then deposing terms. Um, but that it's not a, about a kind of cultivation of, of a unique word um, or a settling on the unique word, but, but ground provision, right? In the way that you and Tanika use that, that, that term, you know, just that kind of, this continual process of finding, <laughs> you know, um, and, and also in its own way, a, a process of gathering. But, but with all that said, we definitely want to know what the one word was that you were going to say. <laughs> um, 
I, I just wanted to say, I think this is a problem of, of first world overabundance because they put a second computer in here on my desk and I think the two of them are interfering with each other. So I've, I've disconnected it and I hope I'll be able to stay with you longer. I really do apologize. Uh, well, the word I was thinking of, uh, which is one that Fred and I have been studying a lot uh, in recent times, another word to think of with regard to credit is betrayal. Um, and particularly with regard to the post-colonial condition, the, 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 the notion that individuation is always a kind of betrayal and that um, when one steps forward, emerges and takes credit um, as a leader, uh, as someone who's educated, uh, as somebody who um, uh, ha has a vision for the future of the country, well, that's the moment of betrayal. Uh, this is a lesson that we've been trying to learn uh, by studying the work of the great uh, Guyanese uh, 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 activist, intellectual feminist, uh, Andaya. And Andaya has a great essay. And the title of the essay is Mr. Slime. And Mr. Slime stands for that person who makes the, who, who accepts the moment of credit, steps out from the village, sells the land of the village from out, out from underneath the people of the village. But what Andaya is trying to teach us in this essay, Mr. Slime, is that this was not a personal failing. Uh, and this is not a moral failing on the part of Mr. Slime. And in fact, she's talking about the work of George Lamming. And later, George Lamming goes so far as to say, actually, I'm Mr. Slime, uh, as a way to emphasize that this is not uh, the, the problem of a moral failing of leadership or, or, or somebody who has personally betrayed a country or a people or a movement, but rather a condition of individuation, a condition in which credit can suddenly in, adhere to the individual who gets credit for uh, leading the movement, speaking for people, um, having the education to make the policy decisions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is, you know, of course, uh, as Fred was saying with regard to the neo-colonial, if the neo-colonial starts before independence, then partly what it is doing during this period is developing the system of credit that will allow for betrayal at the moment of independence. So, so Gayatri Spivak says, the day after negotiated independence is the day decolonization begins. Unfortunately, neocolonialism has already got a 20, 30 year jump start on you by that point. Uh, by the time nations become independent and realize through negotiated independence that they've been betrayed or they will shortly be betrayed. Neocolonialism is already well established as it has been through the colonial period and picks up steam precisely in the way that it, it increases its individuation at the level of class and at the level of the representatives of class. Um, and and at, at becomes a force that cannot be met by, by a counter force, a better state or, or, or a better politician. Um, it, it can only be met by an insistence on a, a practice of gathering in our indebtedness, of, of allowing a kind of access in the face of the most br brutal abuse of access that is, that is precisely at the heart of betrayal, precisely at the heart of credit. And, and that it, it's just, they, that's to think the longest I've been on with you since we started. So I feel very pleased. <laughs> Thank you, Stefano. I was thinking about this last intervention of yours, uh, how there's something that in one of the slangs of the manifestations that we shared with you as well, that it wasn't 30 pesos, it was 30, uh, 200, 500 years. So that, uh, that slang was 
carrying an intuition already of what you are saying about this moments of pacts and uh, credits, because this slogan marks certain historical uh, moments that are the ones that you just signaled. These are dates that talk about the post-dictatorship pacts, the creation of the nation, uh, colonization. So I was thinking about how this is amongst us in the intuition itself that can be condensed in such a precise way in uh, slang that is uh, used by everyone in a motto that is used by everyone. So this is something that is very much condensed in there. And I think that in there, there's a lot to think about in those slogans, in those mottos. We don't have much time. We have, we're uh, already in time. Um, I don't know. I think we had several possibilities to be able to to face all of this. One of them is was it was that maybe there were two big topics that we could at least uh, say, name. One thing there were uh, things that need to be touched on and there were related to antagonism and violence in antagonism. So this is related to general antagonism. And uh, this is related to a question that is very uh, related to the constituent uh, process and many of this uh, social process that have been added to this uh, constitutional uh, moment. And they have done it under the premise of not leaving the streets. And many of the strengths that have been added in this political space. But we have also seen how we have seen the distinction between the legitimate ways and the illegitimate ways of doing policies and how the space of the street and the space of street violence starts to turn into something more and more antagonist to the uh, common ways of political participation. And we thought that this was one of the first things that appeared here. So how to, uh, to see this, how it's presented. And the second thing is related to something that is more effective to uh, taking a phrase that is very, uh, very nice that you gave. You talked about the revueltas. Uh, la revuelta es amar nuestra supervivencia in Spanish. So we wanted to talk about this, about what it means to sustain this manifestation when it's so painful because there people still uh, are getting murdered, there is criminalization, and uh, we have seen in a very painful way, in a very sustained way, the, uh, the eye mutilation and the manifestations on the streets. Um, and up to today, how people still be are being um, killed. So how to sustain the protests in the middle of of all of this, of uh, the grief as well. So we know that these are complicated topics. There are topics that are uh, hard to talk about. And it was, it, it is very difficult. There are things that we want, those things we want to talk to you about. Well, So the, you know, there's an idiom in, you know, American English, you know, that 
And it says something like, well, that's easy for you to say, um, <laughs> you know, uh, because the consequences uh, of saying so um, or the consequences of what one says are, are not equally distributed. Um, they're visited upon different people in different ways. And, um, and, and I recognize that a lot of what I want to say that I have been saying that I, that I guess that I could say, um, it's easy for me to say, um, you know, from the, 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 the comforts of the particular existence that I, um, <laughs> that I, that I have been nurtured and sacrificed into, so to speak, to, to quote, uh, Andaya quoting um, Shinwa Achebe, the great um, Nigerian novelist. Nevertheless, even though it's easy for me to say, I got to say it anyway. Um, and 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 this has to do with this what that however unbearable it is for us to sustain struggle. The alternative to the sustaining of our struggle is an absolute unsustainability, <laughs> right? Like this is how we live. Um, there's a, a young scholar who I knew many years ago when he was a graduate student um, named Nicholas Brady and against my own inclinations and against the grain of my own predilections he insisted at a meeting that we had one day that uh, that debt and death could not be separated that there is at least in English not only an etymological connection between debt and death but that there is a an existential connection. Um, and one way to think about it is that the indebtedness that we share, that we practice, is a, is a, is a sharing and a practice that occurs within in mourning. That, that, that the practice of indebtedness that we share is a practice of mourning too, always. And it is a practice of grief. The grief and the joy are absolutely entangled with one another. They cannot be separated from one another. Um, the dream that they ever could be separated from one another is, um, is an individualist metaphysical political dream that emerges from brutality and produces brutality. This radical entanglement of grief and joy or of life and death, if you will, is, is the, the, the real question is, is can we in our gathering, can we in our own existential practice refine what, it, what we do such that we can live as it were, <laughs> such that we can accept those terms, right? which and the basic term that we would accept would be precisely this unpayability, this unresolvability, you know? I mean, to me, some of what we're talking about, some of the brutality of specifically of United States culture, a whole lot of the brutality of the culture can be seen in its normative practices of grief, right? Um, there's another idiom in American English that is relevant here. Um, get over it, <laughs> right? Like that's the, that, the, what the, the normative practice of grief in the United States can be, can be condensed into that phrase, get over it, okay? And, and, and I think, you know, our struggle is that, you know, is, is, is encapsulated in the sort of we refuse to fucking get over it. We're not gonna get over it. 
okay? We're not gonna forget our, those are dead, okay? We will remember them, we will celebrate them, okay? We will solemnify their life in our refusal to forget them. And we will solemnify their life in our refusal to get to forget them as our own practice of sharing and gathering. Like that's what we do. And, and these are basic practices that, that all of y'all know, you know, we get together to remember people. We refuse to forget them. Right? And and jumping the turnstiles is a refusal to forget. Right. It, within the context of a brutal form of of, of, of imperial neo-colonial imposition that is constantly requiring forgetfulness. We won't forget, we will not forget. Um, we, 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 and we can't forget. We, 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 to re, what remembering implies on a physiological level is that they are with us, that that's the entanglement. And that entanglement manifests itself as a kind of violence. Not only in the sense of the violence of, 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 of imperial attempts to dismember, right? But the violence that is already given in the fact that we can't be separated from. So when we say one is shared, that's a violent formulation, right? That's a that's a if you will, that's a philosophical formulation which is designed to do violence to the very idea of the one. Right? Um, and, and, and it is also a description of our non-ontological or pre-ontological condition. We aren't, we are not one. We never were. None of us were. That, that, that whole mathematics is, is, is insufficient. Um, so when we say that we remember, it's an imprecise term for saying that that the ones that we lost remain with us. Okay. And even and and to and the and to say that the ones that we lost remains remain with us, that too is an imprecise formulation. <laughs> right? We in in a weird way, our sacraments of remembering are nothing other than the continual intoning of these imprecise formulations, right? Which we share with one another at the limit of the words that we have, which is why so much of mourning, so much of gathering moves in the direction of wordlessness and, and movement that can't be captured in, in, in words. It can't be held in words. Sounds that exceed words, that explode words, right? Movements that, that disrupt words, that that, that can't be encapsulated in, in words. So again, it's it's easy for me to say all that, you know, um, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be said. And it doesn't mean that on a sudden fundamental level, as easy as it is for me to say that, it's really hard too. It's really hard to say. Um, Stefano, Stefano, would you like to add something to that? Stefano, would you like to add something to what Fred was saying? Maybe just a small thing, which is uh, if you are watching uh, politics in the United States at all, uh, and a lot of people have to, even if they don't want to, <laughs> uh, you'll know, notice that um, there's a big debate around the teaching in schools of critical race theory. Um, and critical race theory is, a, <clears throat> is an actual approach to study and an academic discipline. But when you read the newspapers, what you hear again and again is, well, it's really strange that there is this white supremacist uh, backlash against critical race theory in the schools because critical race theory is not actually being taught in the schools. This is what the journalists say. 
But this, of course, is completely wrong. Uh, critical race theory is being taught all the time in the United States and well beyond because it doesn't get taught in the schools. Um, it gets taught the same way that those little girls taught each other to jump over the turnstile. Um, and so there's every reason for all of these racist white supremacist parents to be scared that critical race theory is being taught because it is uh, and they can't stop it. Gracias, Stefano. Me avisan que estamos. Um, Thank you so much, Stefano, for that. We are 10 minutes away from finalizing our session, and we have a question, and I would like to give a floor to the audience, and I would like to take this question. I will read it in English, so our translators will help us with that. How many decades it will take to abolish the common sense of the Vitruvian man, I can be, it can be done one white mind at a time. I ask myself, um, what would Ho Chi Minh do? Am I mad? Um, I'm not really sure who asked that question, comment, if you will. Would you like to refer to that somehow? Well, I definitely don't think that the person who asked the question is mad. I think the question who asked the question is reminding me I should say that every day. What would Ho Chi Minh do? I'd be better off. <laughs> it's a really interesting question. Um, I just, I, I have to say, I've never thought about Ho Chi Minh and Vitruvian man in the same thought, but somehow this question totally naturalizes it in a way that I'm like, why haven't I done that? Of course they should be. And it makes me think about, uh, you know, this great, great Vietnamese philosopher and phenomenologist named uh, Duc Tao who was part of that sort of generation that came up with Althusser. And, you know, he was, you know, trained in the French university system, and, but he was also a, a, a revolutionary and freedom fighter in Vietnam. And I'm, and I'm wondering, it makes me, I don't know, this, the, 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 the answer to the question as far, I, it just, well, I, I guess the best way to put it is, is that, that question makes me think I got to dig up uh, my Tranductal and start trying to really read that work in a way that that I've only ever tried to you know, only only ever gesture towards in the past. So um, so I appreciate the question, um, and hopefully uh, someday in the not too distant future when we're actually able to come visit Chile, whoever asked that question could come up and say, "Oh, it was me," and then we can go out and drink <laughs> some beer together and really and really chop that up because. I think it's a deep question. So. Okay. And we'll be ready then. So. <laughs> well, then, in order to take or to use the 10 minutes that we have left, I wanted to ask both of you regarding your understanding of friendship, friendship and love in relation to this idea of incompleteness. In different interviews and talks, you have pointed out the importance of not stopping or continuing to do what we enjoy with others, what it feels vital, as if it were a very evident way of destroying in our heart the logic of the system. In your most recent book, you talked about friendship as something prior right? And you talk about love, which is comprised by joy and sadness or grief from a place which is not individualized, but it is a way of engaging and being in common that make us incomplete or incomplete us, as you said it in English. 
that incomplete each other, that put at stake the idea of the possessive individual owner of themselves. So to conclude, would you like to tell us more about these reflections in your last book and how the practice of love as that which incompletes us allow us to look again at that improvised, noisy, fugitive way of being among the undercommons? Well, um, it, it just feels like a, a pretty, you know, it's kind of connected to what Stefano was saying about critical race theory. Uh, it's not only that critical race theory is constantly being taught in the undercommons, but it's also in a complicated set of ways constantly being caught, taught even within the normative structure of the school system itself against the grain of the administration of the system. It's there's a ubiquity to it that I think has, you know, the sort of racist reactionaries freaking out so much. And and here's so here's what I mean by that. Um, and how this connects to love, which is the formulations that we were making about love and friendship just seem to us to be totally commonplace formulations. And that anybody who would appeal to let's say what we might call the, the very highly organized fiction of their own experience <laughs> would know that love messes you up, okay? It does not leave you intact. That I just don't know that there has ever been a person who has ever been in love who would say that it didn't completely tear them apart, okay? Um, it's just a simple, that's, and, and it's not just me saying it, it's that, you know, pop music says it, you know, romantic comedies say it, you know, there's, this is a commonplace formulation about love. It's, we didn't invent this. And again, it's something that we learn in, in what one might call under common spaces, but it's, but it's there within the framework of the mainstream culture too. It's just a, it's just a truth. Now, the question is, you know, how much of the rest of normative society is also is structured by this strange combination of the constant, you know, assertion of that truth, along with the constant brutal denial of that truth, right? By way of the, co the continual production of a, bu a bunch of stupid romantic myths about love, as if love completes you. Okay. So, so this is, we were just, what we were doing was just noting that that this commonplace formulation about love, that it disrupts, that it tears up, that it breaks you down, that that's part of the atmospheric condition in which we live. Um, and the only question is, how do we develop sufficient strength and sufficient, you know, sort of suppleness to be able to accept that condition? rather than to be always operating in an absolute refusal of that condition, okay? One, one possible way to define capitalism would be is that it is the organized economic refusal of that condition. Yeah, I, 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 there's very little for me to add. That's exactly how we think about it except to say that, or in addition to say that it's, it's, it's obvious that, that that's what love and friendship are, uh, especially, you know, if you listen to music or, or, you know, or you live your life. But at the same time, um, that it, it's totally antithetical to, to, to the rest of the way it's that we are regulated. So, you know, we are regulated towards productivity, towards efficiency, uh, towards uh, development. Uh, and, and if love or friendship, uh, uh, you know, cause you to, to, to be less capable of those things because you are able to uh, um, experience your incompleteness, your, your, your sharedness, your, um, um, your interanimation, your your entangledness with others, um, that makes you 
um, a less uh, a less useful individual um, to capital and to the state because it's the individual who who is the the motor of development of efficiency uh, of productivity um, and a certain type of individual who's in control of herself or himself who um, who works on himself or herself uh, and who um, measures himself or herself uh, or their self uh, and 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 that 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 pro productive individual is undermined by a, an idea of love or a practice of love or friendship that um, that 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 is anti-productive or um, that uh, develops values other than efficiency or that um, you know questions the very idea of development um, and and that and that's the that's what we practice with each other but it's what we practice all around ourselves as much as we can do and what we've learned um, from those who've practiced it with us bueno tristemente well sadly we are going to have to start saying goodbye there are many things that we wanted to share with you that we will not have time to but Fer, I don't know if you want to say something, if you want to add anything. Only, only it's uh, great thanks and gratitude and, um, and uh, resolve um, that we will pick up the conversation uh, again soon um, and in person and, uh, and, um, Yeah, just thank you. Thank you so much. Eh, muchas gracias a ustedes también. Yo voy a aprovechar aquí de decir que... Thank you. I am going to say that uh, being able to read your work has been a shelter. So thank you for your generosity of sharing with us today. And I really hope that we can have another conversation together. Fernanda, uh, please, uh, do you want to say something? Yes, I also want to thank you all. And I also hope that this conversation is a possibility for the people who have not read the book for them to start reading it. And, and learn about some of the conversations that can be started from their work. I think that they're very valuable. And yeah, that that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. In spite of all of the technical problems that we had and the improvisations <laughs> that we had, I think that, that is part of all of this, uh, of the conversation. And thank you for your space and generosity. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, Alika. Gracias también a a Viviana, a Nancy y a Laura que nos han estado apoyando. Thank you very much, Viviana, Nancy, and Laura, who has been who have been the interpreters today. And I want to invite you to the next. A conference, uh, Paula Arena Kurikaski is going to be with us, and this is going to be available on the YouTube channel in the and on the page of the of the center as well. If you want to check this, and well, thank you very much. A hug to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.